Well, good morning, you wonderful people. It's Sunday, the 18th of April, and uh, we're going to continue our theme for the year. We've been looking at this concept of John 15, and um, we've been specifically focusing these last few weeks on this concept of ask of the Father. And uh, the reason we're doing that is because John 15, verse 7 says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And then he repeats in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. And then we've been following that up with James chapter 4, verse 2 says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And then James writes it this way, You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrong. To spend it on your passion and so we've been looking at this we've been looking at how do we make sure we're asking right and uh, last week we looked at some lessons just from the book of Matthew that uh, that Jesus teaches on asking and we saw that he says we must not ask like the hypocrite and try and impress people but it's about impressing God and uh, we looked at the importance of praying in agreement um, with what God is saying and in praying in agreement with one another and again that element of praying with faith um, are just some of the keys that we, we could have and use. But this morning I want to look at something a bit different. I want to look from the book of Mark and I want to look at some prayer blockers, um, things that stop us from asking correctly. And so if you've got your, your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 6 and you're going to look at verse 22. And so today I just want to look at three ans- or three blocks in asking. And the first one is asking driven by a grudge and we find this very interesting little story in Mark chapter 6 and I want to read from verse 22 to 24 for when Herodias daughter came in and danced she pleased Herod and his guests and the king said to the girl ask me whatever you wish and I will give it to you and he vowed to her whatever you ask I will give to you even up to half of my kingdom and she went out and said to her mother What should I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And you kind of read this and you think, what an unusual thing to ask for. Here, this daughter is um, dancing for her stepdad, um, King Herod. And Herod is so impressed that he says to her, just ask anything you want. And so she goes home and she's excited and says, Mom, I can get anything I want in the kingdom. What do I ask for? And Herod is says, I want the head of John the Baptist. In other words, I want John the Baptist killed. And that's an unusual thing to ask for. But it's because there was this deep-seated grudge in Herodias, because John the Baptist had spoken out against her marriage to King Herod, and it publicly embarrassed her. And she was so angry that she was willing to waste this opportunity for her daughter, this blessing that her daughter had been given. She wanted to waste that on a grudge. And as I was thinking about this, I read an article, um, and it's, the article wrote uh, like this. No one would have guessed that Leonard Holt was a ticking time bomb. He'd worked as a lab technician for the same Pennsylvania mill factory for 19 years. He was respected as a Boy Scout leader. He was a devoted father, member of the Fire Brigade, and a regular churchgoer. But on a cold October morning, Leonard stuffed a 45 automatic and a Smith & Weston .38 in his coat pockets and after driving his station wagon to the mill he went into the shop and calculated a frenzy began to execute people that he had known for 15 years his community was left bewildered that a mild-mannered man could become a mass murderer but the investigation that followed pieced together a profile of seething resentment it seems that seven of the victims had been promoted over him while he remained in the same position Some of the people that used to drive in his carpool quit riding with him because of his reckless driving. And so resentment had been building up for years. And then it eventually exploded in rage. But there was interesting, there was three articles, three words that appeared beneath his picture in the Time magazine article. Responsible, respectful, but resentful. You see, when allowed to fester resentment, bearing a grudge can often explode doing irreparable damage often leading to domestic violence 
ugly demeaning words being said, sometimes people losing their jobs, sometimes ending up in divorce, the list could go on. This seems to be what happened to Herodias. The New International Version reads this, says, So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. Did you pick up that word? Nursed. Suggests that this anger deep inside of her was something that she fed. She kept it growing like a tumor until it came out in the form of hate. And then manipulation and ultimately violence. It was like an ember of fire that just kept blowing on it until it erupted into a blazing fire out of control. Do you know anyone like that? Maybe you're the guilty party. Could you be nursing a grudge? You're holding a grudge against someone? And is this grudge causing a stumbling block? I can imagine that she was so caught up in this grudge that she had for John the Baptist that she missed an opportunity of being able to bless her daughter. Missed an opportunity of being able to, to do something great. But she wasted it because of a grudge. And I wonder how many times we, we waste opportunities that we could be blessing. Because all we can think about is this person that we're holding a grudge against. And ultimately it blocks our relationship with God. And ultimately it stops us from asking Father for things that are so important. Because all we can think about is this grudge. And so the first thing that Mark says is if you're holding a grudge, it can stop you from being blessed. It can stop you from asking effectively. And the second thing that we find in the book of Mark just a little bit later that can also stop us from asking correctly is when we ask driven by pride. There's an interesting story in Mark chapter 10 and I want to read from verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they, they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism that I am going to be baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and the baptism, the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant but for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to serve to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, another thing that can be a huge block when it comes to asking is this thing of ambition. Ambition is a common human motivation. We see it played out in the lives of countless men and women throughout history. And in this passage, we find two various aspects of ambition. We find the one role model is Jesus who's, who's on a mission. He, uh, even from his earliest days, he knew what his purpose in life was to do. And that was to do God the Father's will. You remember the story in Luke's Gospel when he was only 12 years old and he remained behind in Jerusalem in order to discuss the things of God with the Jewish religious scholars. When his parents came to retrieve him, he said to them, Don't you know that I'm about my father's business? You see, Jesus knew from the goal, from the beginning, that was what he came to do. He came to do his father's will. And here, Jesus pulls his disciples aside and explains to them for the third time that he's about to do God's will. This time he comes even in more detail, just above the passage we read. He said, listen, I'm going to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and whip him and kill him. But after three days... He will rise again. And so Jesus says, this is my ambition. This is what I've come to do. But here we find another ambition in James and John. Because even though they're listening to what Jesus is saying. And they're hearing what he's saying. That he's about to go to Jerusalem to, to die. They didn't hear that. Because every religious Jew in the day believed that the Son of Man. The one who they 
believed the prophecy of Daniel was coming to reign in power. They didn't have this concept of a suffering son of man, didn't even register in their imagination. And so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus evidently, not hearing anything he's just said, and they make the request, say, hey Jesus, we know what you're going to do. You're going to Jerusalem to, to take over, to be in charge. And when that happens, can we uh, have these places of honor? One of us on your right, one of us on your left, because we're ready to do that. You see, James and John really thought they were special. And they had their reasons. Obviously, out of all the disciples, there were three that were extra close, and that was James and John and Peter. They'd been on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there among some miracles that the other disciples didn't get to see. For example, the raising of the little girl from the dead earlier in his ministry. And so they were well qualified to be ruling with Messiah. But here we have again have two different pictures of ambition. We have Jesus who is driven by passion to do his father's will. And James and John who are driven by the passion to want to be better than anyone else. And it's the same way in the world. Perhaps you've been driven by that same kind of ambition and well. And that we just want to do better. We just want to seem like we're better. Sometimes that creeps into our prayer time too. Where our prayer time becomes so, so focused on just making ourselves seem better. We, we be filled with pride. Filled with I'm better than anyone else. And it, it dominates how we pray and what we ask for in the God. And of course, the other disciples were really ticked off by what James and John had trying to jump the queue. But probably deep down they were all wanting to do the same thing too. And so Jesus explains it even more simple for them. He says, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different, he says. Whoever wants to be the leader must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave to everyone. And then Jesus gives himself again as the example. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The Apostle Paul, who gave up his own personal pursuits, and uh, this pursuit for self-righteousness, he exchanged it all for the knowing of Christ. He writes this about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. Though he was God, he did not think of equity, of equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. We who claim to be followers of Jesus must be like him, who did not come to be served, but rather came to serve. There's this inborn yearning in each of our souls to be significant. We want to be known. We want to be accepted for who we are and we want to be loved. And that's what it means to be human. But in our brokenness and sin, many of us are driven by self-serving ambition that will never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied when you pursue just your own ambitions. It is the way of Jesus. You've got to lose your life in Jesus so that you can truly find it. You've got to lay down your ambitions and fruitless search for significance and then you will truly find it. You see, when you are in Christ, you are a somebody. You're a child of the King and a co-heir with Jesus in all the riches of His Kingdom. And so, sometimes we can allow this, this pride, this selfish ambition to dominate and to block our prayer life. And the third thing that we find from the book of Mark that can sometimes get a, be a stumbling block for us is when we ask with unforgiveness in our hearts. We find this one in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 25. Jesus writes this, And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received in it, it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespass. And so again, we, we get a little link to, uh, to what we looked a little bit at last week, where 
He starts with the, the most important thing is faith. You got to pray and believe. When you pray in faith, it's what releases God's power. Jesus says it so clearly. He says, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. You see, the thing about faith is that you must believe God before you see the answer to your prayer. In other words, when you ask God for something, you should begin to act like God has already answered that prayer. I remember a few years ago when we had a prayer meeting for, for rain. And uh, the guest speaker said, well, here we're getting together to pray for rain, but no one brought an umbrella. Are we really trusting God for rain? If so, why don't we come with our umbrellas when we're praying for rain? James 1 verse 5 and 6 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. And then James adds, But when he asks, you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And so he starts off, Mark starts the passage similar to what we looked at in Matthew, that there's got to be an element of faith. But then he, he focuses more on the second part, which we touched a little bit on last week. And that's this element of when you pray with forgiveness, you receive God's mercy. Jesus adds to that, he said, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You see, sometimes we, we get this principle misunderstood and some people think that we, we must forgive others in order to, in so that we can earn God's forgiveness. But that's putting the cart before the horse. A person who's truly been forgiven by God will have the spirit of forgiveness towards others. And so he's saying if you refuse to forgive someone, it's simply revealing that you haven't really comprehended God's free grace in your own life. But the truth is forgiveness doesn't come easy. By nature, we are creatures of revenge, and we want to exact an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus comes and teaches us that we're to love our enemies and to forgive those who've wronged us. For many years, Dr. William Willimon, Will Will who was a chaplain at Duke University, he wrote this about forgiveness. The human animal is not supposed to be good at forgiveness. Forgiveness is not some innate, natural human emotion. Vengeance, retribution, violence, these are natural human qualities. It is natural for the human animal to snarl and crouch in defense, defensive position when attacked, to howl when wronged, and to bite back when bitten. Forgiveness is not natural. And isn't that so true? Forgiveness is not something that comes easy. But forgiveness is an act of choice. Forgetting is a passive process in which a matter fades from our memory as time passes. The sad thing is when it comes to people who have offended us, we, we often have total recall. But forgiving them for Christ's sake and letting go of it, even when we still remember what they did, is what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness means that you don't actively go digging in your memory and pulling up those acts so that you can remember Forgiveness is releasing someone from your desire for revenge. As we said, our natural desire is to hurt those who hurt us. When someone insults us in school, remember what we say? Bounce off me and back on you. Or maybe you read that bumper sticker, I don't get mad, I get even. Kind of just reflects what society thinks like. But the Bible word for forgive is a female and it means to send away, to release. It's kind of like this picture of you holding someone by the throat and you, 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 you want to strangle, but instead you, you let them go, release them. That's kind of the heart behind this. Forgiveness is letting go of that harmful urge. How do we release someone that's hurt us? We forgive them. You do it for their sake and you do it for your own sake. You don't forgive them because they ask you to forgive them, you do it because God has forgiven you. They might not even ask you to forgive them, but you can forgive them anyway. Release them. One of my commentator, Bible commentators that I like to read, Warren uh, Wisp, says this, The world's darkest prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. Some of the most miserable people I've met have been those who would not forgive others. They dream about punishing the one who wronged them, and they don't realize that they're only punishing themselves. So often we have this unforgiveness in our heart and it just blocks us 
from being able to approach our Father because we feel guilty. And so we don't want to go to God. But he says, and there's another story where Jesus is saying, if you bring your gift to the altar before you even leave it, he says, and you remember that you've got some wrong against someone, he says, put down the altar before you come and worship, go and sort it out. And then come and worship. And this is what God is saying. He says, before you run and come and ask God for things, he says, just check and see if there's some unforgiveness that maybe could be blocking your prayer. I'm going to close, close with a story of, that I uh, found with Corrie ten Boom, who's a well-known, uh, who was imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II because her family provided a hiding place for the Jews um, who were being arrested. And so she and her sister Betty were sent to uh, Ravensburg and uh, there they experienced some horrible torture and even the death of her sister uh, eventually. But Corrie miraculously survived and she became an effective Christian author and speaker. But in 1947, she was invited to speak in Munich, Germany. The evening she spoke on the topic of forgiveness and how God buries our sins in the depths of the sea. And after her talk, she was approached by a man who looked familiar to her. With horror, she recognized him as one of the cruelest guards at the concentration camp. She remembered the shame of having to walk naked in front of this man every day. Suddenly, all the fear and hatred returned in a flash. The guard came to her and said, in your talk, you mentioned Ravensburg. I was a guard there, but since that time I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from you as well, Fräulein. He held out his hand to Corey and said, will you forgive me? Here's how Corey describes the encounter in her own words. It would not have been many seconds that he stood there, held out his hand, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. I stood there with this coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift up my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one that stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and a former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did that day. You see, unforgiveness is something that will hinder our prayers. Unforgiveness will hinder our faith. Unforgiveness will hinder our battle with doubt. Unforgiveness will hinder our fruitfulness. Unforgiveness is serious. But we can also turn that into a positive. We could say it this way. Forgiveness enhances our prayers. Forgiveness enhances our faith. Forgiveness enhances our battle with doubt. Forgiveness enhances our fruitfulness. Because forgiveness is powerful. And so maybe this morning one of these three things are blocking your asking from God. Maybe you're asking with a bit of bitterness hiding in there. Maybe you've been asking with a bit of unforgiveness there. And maybe you've been asking for a bit of own selfish ambitions. He says, let's do some soul searching and let's see, are we asking God with these wrong motives this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. As we look through the Gospel of Mark, these, these lessons we get on prayer, these lessons on asking. Father, sometimes we miss so many opportunities because of, of, of just bitterness, because of holding a grudge that stops us from having the fullness of what God wants to do with us. Sometimes, Father, it's because of selfish ambition that drive to want ourselves to do well instead of others. And sometimes there's unforgiveness hiding there. So Lord, I pray as we go this week that we would do some searching in our hearts to see if there are any of these three things that are blocking us from coming into the throne room of grace and mercy and asking and receiving from our Father. Help us to search today, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.